All right, Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. I love this passage. It's a story that's represented in more than one gospel, but I want to refer to Mark's because I like uh, Mark's approach to it, and uh, I'm using this particular translation because of a particular phrase that I want to hone in on. Verse 42, so Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Sound like L.A., don't it? Sound like America. Rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, somebody say among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be the leader among you must be your servant. My God today, look at Jesus. I love, I love how Jesus rose. Listen, he said the rulers in this world loaded over and officials flaunt their authority over. But among you, it will be different. Whoever among you wants to be the leader must be the servant. He said, this is the upside down kingdom. In the world, you got to lord it over people. These people wanted to be lords. But Jesus came as a servant, and what do we call him? Lord. He's, oh man, y'all going to get it. <clears throat> whoever wants to be the leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first or the greatest or the chiefest among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is gangster. The whole world does it this way. He's like, we're not doing it that way. Among you, it will be different. It will be different. My title for the sermon today is, I'm built different. I'm just built different. I ain't, listen, I'm built different. Y'all might think that that's the way to do it, but I'm built different. Like, y'all think the way up is that way and, 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 and to push your way, but I'm built different. Jesus said, I got to serve, so I, I'm not going to look for the high chair because I, I, in my experience with three children, high chairs are for babies. I don't need a high chair to have value. I don't need to be sitting at the table to have value. I don't need people to recognize me. I don't need to flaunt my authority in order to have authority. Because if I got to flaunt authority to have authority when I no longer have authority, y'all ain't going to rock with me. You ever notice how people that flaunt their authority and lord their power, as soon as they fall from grace, they have nobody around them? Why? Because we were only following you because you had the authority. When you no longer have the authority, we no longer follow you. We don't rock with you. I don't want those types of people in my life. I want the people in my life to feel served and valued and lifted up so that when life happens, when I make a mistake, when things don't go the way I planned for them to go, they don't just leave me because they were only with me because of my authority. Look at somebody say, I'm built different. I'm built different. If you know that God has a plan for your life and this is not the end of the story, but what you see right now is just a preview if you know that what is going on in your life is just merely the trailer to the movie of what God's plan is for your life, and you know that this is not the end of the story, I need somebody in this room to say, I'm built different. Because I'm going to help you today. If you really want what God has for you, I'm going to tell you how to get it. I'll tell you how to get it from my own experience and from the scriptures. Talk to you. This is one of my favorite subjects, y'all. And I know people think music. Of course, music is one of my favorite things. But you would be surprised to know, my wife will tell you this and my children, I don't love to play. And I'm not a lover of music like that. I do like it, I love it, but I'm, it's not like, oh, I just wake up every day and that's all I want to do is music. That's not it for me. You know what I like about music? I like the impact that it makes. I like how it can shift a room, how it can shift a relationship. I love how a song can impact your heart. I heard a story of a young man who was nonverbal, who was uh, mentally, uh, what do you call that, um, neurodivergent. Yeah. And he could not communicate with his parents. And he was in a specialized school for students that were neurodivergent. And this young man 
was in a class where a teacher was wise enough that every time it was time to use the restroom, they would play the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Mm -hmm. The one that we hear at the seventh inning of most baseball games, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And she would pick up the kids and take them to the restroom. Now this child had soiled himself over and over at home because he couldn't communicate to his parents what his needs were. They had to literally be watching him to catch him before an accident happened. Well, over time, he started to associate that song with his need to go to the restroom. And for the first time, he was able to communicate with his parents. And he said, take me out to the ball <laughs> And they said, oh, he's got to go to the restroom. And they wept tears. Yeah. That's what I love about music. It's not that it you know, makes money, and yes, I thank God that I've been able to support my family by that, but it's what it does in a room and how it impacts people. And I learned early from my father to use my gift to serve a purpose. Amen. And most people, when they meet me at this season of my life, this is all you know. You see me, and this is the picture that you see in your head if you Google me. <laughs> This is that moment that all of us have, we pray about. This is what we hope for. This is what we dream about. This is what, we, this is what I'm trying to get to. This is what I'm trying to get to. But years ago, before this, this was happening. This is the picture people don't know. This is the, that's where it starts. It's, I'm the same person. My father used to look at me and say, you play for Jesus. Amen. I'll get on the keys, and then when I started getting good, I started looking around. Who heard that move I did? My dad was like, put your head down. It's not about you. Serve the people. Help them encounter God. Oh, my God. I could cry right now because I realized that that heart opened the door for the picture that you know. I was the same person playing those keys that I am right now. I'm talking to you from the same heart. I'm the same guy, same history, same parents, same challenges, same triumphs. And I'm telling you, when you're faithful there, there's a young man that plays keys for us. Often y'all know his name is Jonte. Jonte drives a long way to believe LA to play keys. And Jonte came to me and said, Pastor, I don't want to get money for this. I don't want to be compensated. I just want to serve. Mm, amen. So when I come, just don't, don't even worry about it. I just want to be here. Amen. Nobody wants to know John Tay's story. Nobody beating his door down to take him to lunch. Nobody's calling him. Hey, man, how's it going? How can I pray for you, John Tay? Like, what's going on in your life? How's your wife? How's your kids? Because this part is what we don't, we don't value this guy. We don't value that guy like that. We appreciate what he does, but he's a, he's a backdrop to the big show. But these are the spaces that make way for breakthrough. These are the people that open up the door for us to come in and cry and go through tissue boxes like crazy and leave the building and throw them away and forget that somebody has to take that trash out. It's the people that serve in the darkness that make it possible for us to worship in the light. And what I love about people like John Tay is he doesn't just show up when he has to play. And I did not even know he was going to be here this week because he wasn't on the list. But Jonte is sitting right there on the third row, faithfully worshiping God. And so stand up, Jonte. Jonte Moore, amazing heart of a servant. Amazing heart of a servant. At 7 a.m. when we're waking up, most of us, some of us are a little bit later than that. <laughs> there are people that show up on this campus and they begin to set this up. Sometimes the sun is not up and we got people praying and worrying about it. Like, oh, is this here? Is this there? Is this there? We got people that show up early. I can't name everybody, but I want you to know that sometimes we feel like we're overqualified to serve. Oh, man, I don't do that no more. How in the world do you outgrow serving? How? How? Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the one that died for our sins, the wisest, most anointed, most powerful, most elevated being, the only one that could have said I outgrew anything. 
said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So who are we to outgrow serving? There's a young man who has young children. I'm just wiping excuses away. Young babies. And a wife. And a business. And an entire Juris doctor that shows up at 7 a.m. to put signs on the street. Then he changes his clothes and walks on this platform with his wife. And looks like he just showed up 20 minutes ago. Pastor Corlandos has the heart of a servant. He doesn't have to do it. He's just built different. John Tay doesn't have to do it. He's just built different. I want to know if there's anybody in this room that says, I want to be great. I want to be what God calls me to be. I want to be a leader. I want my life to matter. I want people to look at me and say, man, they made a difference in my life. Not they were just amazing. They made a difference in my life and in the world around them. When I am no longer here, I want the story to be he cared about people. If that's you today and you built different, somebody shout, I'm built different. Come on in here. That's who we are. When we first launched Believe LA, a pastor who's a dear friend of mine from Texas said to me, before you launch your church, before you launch your church, you need to pray and identify what is the prevailing principality in that area of Calabasas. What that means is, what is the thing that is the big problem? What is the mindset that makes it difficult for people in this area? I had a conversation with the captain of the Lost Hills Sheriff Department because I don't just do Sundays. I told y'all Sunday is the locker room. I'm just literally coaching y'all up so you can go out of here and do what God called you to do. This is not the game, saints. This is not the game. Your Christianity and your service and your life is not about this room. It's about what you receive in this room and then you take it out and you impact the world around you. And I sat with the sheriff, the captain of the sheriff's department, Captain C2, and we sat for an hour and I shared with her our vision and our heart and the things we want to do. Because I believe when you come into an area, you need to let them know you're here. She was like, oh, I got you guys. We're looking out for you. If you want to, we can park a car out front, whatever you think you need. In fact, I want to come visit church. She shared with me. She said, I used to work in South Central L.A. for the sheriff's department for years. She said, you know what the primary difference between South Central and Calabasas and this valley? I said, what? She said, down there, people look out for each other. I said, say what? (laughs) She said, yeah, they look out for each other. There's crime, there's challenges. They look out for each other, generally. She said, you know what the challenge out here is? I said, what? She said, they try to keep up with each other. I was like, you better preach, Captain C2. You better call it out. And if I'm honest, before I put it on a vim, I ain't going to lie, I saw that Tesla truck and I was like, oh. I could get one of those. I think I could. Let me check this. How many have ever been there where you saw something somebody had and you're like, man, I feel like I need to have that too? Why though? Because there's something inside of us that wants to aspire to greatness, yes. There's some of us that know that there's better than what we have, yes. But there's also this selfish part of us that just wants to have things just to have them because they look good on somebody else. But I'm going to tell you, everything that looked good ain't good. Somebody can have something and they might be all right for it because they got the grace for it. You don't have that grace on your life. You ought not be praying for things that you don't have a grace for. If it hasn't come into your life yet, it's probably not for you. (laughs) And there's something powerful about a private plane that we don't know about. It's called called, uh, maintenance, but uh, compulsory maintenance. You got to get... Maintenance done that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, even though ain't nothing wrong with the plan. Certain mileage you hit, it's like, yep, here's your $50,000 maintenance. And that doesn't include the fuel, that doesn't include the hours, it doesn't include, include the pilot, it doesn't include the hanger fees, it doesn't include the ground crew, it doesn't incru- include that you got to hire a pilot. Y'all think you want a private plane, you don't want them problems yet, unless you got the grace for it. Listen, what you need to be asking God is, Lord, put me in the heart of a servant so much that somebody that owns a private plane comes to me and says, anytime you need to go somewhere, because you've been such a servant 
to my life, I'm going to allow you the blessing that I have a grace for. Boy, I like this kind of preaching right here, man. I like this kind of preaching because it puts it where the goats can get it, as the people down south say. Living this life of Christ-likeness requires self-sacrifice. And Jesus challenges these guys. Let me tell you this story about these guys. Like, so if you go to verse 35, there's a conversation between Jesus and two of his disciples, James and John. This is how this whole thing happens. James and John are two of Jesus' disciples. They come to Jesus and they ask him a pretty arrogant question. They say, hey, will you do anything we ask? Excuse me? (laughs) He says, what do you want? Because he knew what was in their heart. So they said, when you come into your kingdom, let us sit on the left hand and the right hand of you. Can can we we roll with you? Can we rock with you? Can I be your right hand man? And can, can my brother be your left hand man? That's how the story starts. And Jesus knew what was going on in their heart. He he, he already knew. Like James and John are called the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee is their father. Zebedee is a fisherman. He taught his sons to fish. When Jesus called James and John, their father stayed in the boat and said, I'm going to keep funding the family. Aren't you grateful for people that will continue to work so that church can keep going and your ministry can keep going. Listen, everybody can't be a preacher. (laughs) If we all preach, we'll go broke. Somebody got to go work. (laughs) And I work outside of here because there's things that I have to do outside of this space. So I'm grateful for the Zebedees in the world. But James and John were two disciples that his father, their father worked for them so they could follow Jesus. And guess who else decided to go with James and John? Their mother. S-A-L-O-M-E, pronounced Salome. Their mom was also, the Bible says, a disciple of Jesus, meaning she followed him as well. Salome happens to be the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary and Salome grew up together. They're sisters, which means that sisters, Salome and Zebedee, have kids. Mary has a son named Jesus. Salome has two children named James and John, which makes them Jesus' cousins. Ain't it wild how family will just feel like they're entitled to your stuff just because they're your cousins and them? <laughs> ain't that a trip? Family will just show up. They ain't get nothing in this investment. They won't show up. Hey, when you get into your kingdom, cuz, look out for your boy. Let me sit to the right of you and let my brother sit to the left of you. Family is a trip, ain't they? People like that, I just watch them. I'm like, you're not my family. You're just a relative. Uh-uh. Because my family is the ones that rocked me with me when I had nothing. My family is the ones that I can call when things aren't going well and they show up. My family ain't the ones that show up when everything is good. You want to be in my glory, you got to be part of my story, okay? Can I get a witness in here? (laughs) But now to be fair, James and John were disciples. And they were faithful. And they followed Jesus. And they thought they had a claim to be with their cousin. Jesus knew what was in their heart. And this is where he calls it out. Because it started an argument. These boys talking about who's going to be the greatest, they literally said, who's the greatest among us? Who's the greatest? Jesus, who's the GOAT? Which one of us is the GOAT? Which one of us is the greatest, Jesus? Like, you, you've been watching us. Like, which one of us is the greatest? You know, 54% of teenagers, when you ask them what they want to be, you know what they want to be? An influencer. I want to stream and make millions of dollars. <laughs> I want to be on YouTube and make, I want to be famous. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be the GOAT. Isn't that interesting? Culture is infatuated with fame. And here's the thing with James and John. They come to Jesus because they realize he's getting ready to come into the kingdom. They misunderstood that he was talking about a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. So they assumed it was going to be flex. We're going to flex. We're going to sit next to Jesus. We're going to be balling out. And listen, when God begins to bring about the manifestation of his promise in your life, you need to be mindful of who's asking to sit next to you. Some people don't want to sit next to you because they love you or want to help you. Some of them want to sit next to you because they're ambitious and they got a plan. Some of them want to sit next to you because they want exposure because they know sitting next to you is going to make them look good. They want to borrow your shine. Some people want to sit next to you because they have no intention of working on their own and they want to just live off of the hard work that you do. Others 
want to sit next to you because they don't understand what it means to sit next to you. And Jesus looked at his cousins and says, can you drink from the cup that I can drink of? And you know what these knucklehead dudes said? Yes, we can. You know what he said? Indeed you will. And you know what happened? They tasted the persecution that came from sitting next to Jesus. You know what I like about Jesus? This is how cold Jesus is. Oh, yeah, you want to drink from my cup? Come with me, Peter, James, and John, because all of y'all fighting about who's the greatest. I'm getting ready to go pray before I'm going to be crucified. And they had to watch the anguish of what it meant to sit in that seat. They had to watch Jesus pray and sweat drops of blood. They watched him plead with his father. They watched Elijah and Moses show up in the garden. They realized at that moment, wait a minute. I don't think we can drink of this cup. Because it requires more than just sitting and looking pretty to be a part of the kingdom. You have to be willing to serve. Somebody say, I'm built different. Yeah, I'm different. You can't be same and be different. (laughs) You can't hang out with same and be different. You need to hang out with people that understand your calling. You know what I love? I don't love tennis, but I love watching it. Any tennis fans in here? I enjoy it. I enjoyed the story of uh, Venus and Serena. I, I enjoyed just that story, like coming out of the hood and a sport that's never been seen like that, like that heavy that I know of in, in South Central LA. And these girls just went to the top. Incredible. Uh, Billie Jean King, John McEnroe. I used to watch him break rackets on the thing in Wimbledon and US, all, of, all the things. I enjoy it. I can't play it at all. <laughs> can't play tennis. Too fat. No. Requires too much running. <laughs> I ain't about all that. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> can't, can't. Ping pong. Ping pong I can do. But my friends who play tennis have enlightened me to a few things about tennis. Before the match, there's a coin toss. Because the very first thing, what's the first thing you do in a tennis match? Serve. I don't, <laughs> I'm going somewhere. Yeah. I don't know how to play it, but from what they tell me, you really want to serve first. (laughs) Oh, they got it. You want to serve first. You play tennis. You want to serve first because serving first helps set the tone of the match. Serving first also helps dictate the pace of the game. And a strong serve can put pressure on your opponent from the very beginning. I wonder if we realize in the kingdom of God that when we learn to serve others first, it can set the tone of your relationships and interactions. Jesus said, among you it will be different. The rulers of this world lord it over the people, but among you it will be different. Serving is not about your position, it's about your disposition. It's not about the seat you're sitting in. It's about how you handle the space that God has trusted you with. How do you treat others when you're in a place of authority? Jesus is looking for that. He wants people that can sit in that seat and see his children and say, I see value in you, and I'm not here to lord it over you. I'm here to lift you up so that you can become the best thing that God designed for you to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hate going out to eat with people that treat waiters and servers bad. You can't eat with me. No, sir. No, ma'am. Keep that over there. No, because you have to, the way you treat them is the way you really feel about people. They're a people. Man, serving is not about your position. It's about your disposition. And when we prioritize serving others with humility and compassion, we create an environment of kindness and generosity that fosters meaningful connections and sets the tone. Man, you can set the tone in your relationships when you're like, hey, man, is there anything I can do to help you? It dictates the pace. You can dictate the pace of the game. Serving in the kingdom of God and in life can also lead to advantages. Setting, dictating the pace is an advantage for you because you get ahead. Here's the deal. My life moves at the speed of relationship. Relationship moves at the speed of trust. And surprise is the beginning of trust. Let me tell you what that means. Surprise, it's like, oh, that pastor's pretty cool. I thought he would be a trip. I thought he'd be like the other people. Oh, that lady is really nice. 
I couldn't believe that. There's so many people that have come to this church. In fact, there's an influencer, a social influencer that, that my daughter and I saw yesterday that posted our church. Such a sweet post. She was like, oh, Calabasas, that's a dope church. You need to go visit. She didn't have to do that, but she was surprised at how kind and how different, how different it was from certain experiences. Let me tell you something. It doesn't mean that you're better. It just means that you're different. And the difference is better. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're better. It just means you're different. And the difference is better. Amen? We want to be different. I call and text people all week just to check on them. It's a surprise. But man, I know you're busy. You're at the church, blah, blah, blah. Man, I just want to check on you. I just want you to know I love you. How many of y'all have gotten that text out of random? Nowhere, out of nowhere. Benny, I see hands. Because I believe in relationship, and life moves at the speed of relationship. Relationship moves at the speed of trust. If I can't trust you, we can't do nothing together. And surprise is the beginning of trust. I get it. Sometimes we don't like people. How many of y'all are like, I'm just not a people person? I get it. You ask me as a pastor, what's the best thing about pastoring? The people. Woo. Sorry, man, I just messed the microphone. You know what else is the, you know the hardest thing about pastoring? <laughs> the people. <laughs> so, so I get it. But when I serve people out of my love for Jesus and his love for people, I begin to love what he loves. And Jesus said, among you, it will be different. Doesn't mean you have to tolerate abuse. Doesn't mean you can't set boundaries. It doesn't mean that you protect your emotional space and don't let people abuse your service. But it does mean you have to be different. Because God wants his children to be like him. Finally, serving puts pressure on your opponent. Serving first. Serving puts pressure on the enemy because he's looking for a place to undermine the blessing of God in your life. He's looking for ways to undermine the blessing of God in your life. So when you take on the disposition of Jesus and you serve, even when it's hard, even when you don't feel like it, even when they don't deserve it, even when they get on your nerves, it puts pressure on the enemy. Romans 12, 17 through 20. If you don't believe me, believe the Bible in the words of Paul. If it is possible, this is the out for me. Thank you, Paul, for this one. As far as it depends on you, <laughs> right? That's the, I ain't got to tolerate abuse. If, if it depends on me, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. In other words, when you treat people right, God will take care of them. You can't get the type of vengeance that the Lord can get. God will disturb people's sleep when they do you wrong. I'm a witness. I have been good to people that were not good to me, and they came back to me months Later, saying, man, I'm sorry. I don't even understand why I was that way to you. But I couldn't sleep until I got this off my chest. God will bother your enemy when you do right. God will trouble their sleep. You want to talk about getting somebody back. The best way to get somebody back is to back up. Lord, you got it. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Verse 21, actually, in doing, no, 20. In doing this, you will heap burning coals. You ever had somebody you wish some burning coals? I'm sorry. Come back, Holy Spirit. <laughs> On his head. Verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I want to read it in the message because I love it in this translation. Then I'm going to close the sermon. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in, you get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him. Surprise. Surprise, surprise. I see that meme. I don't know why. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> it was surprising with goodness. 
Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Is there anybody that wants to get the best of evil by doing good? You know what? Serving doesn't just put the pressure on your enemy. It puts the pressure on you. It puts the pressure on you. Because now you have to look at yourself and say, Lord, if this is the way that you want me to live my life selflessly, to live selfless doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It just thinks it means you think of yourself less. I don't think about myself all the time. I'm looking out for the needs of others. When I stood on this platform, I had a decision to make. Would I be selfless? Or would I be self-conscious or self-motivated? Because I know there's cameras going. I know y'all are taking notes. And there's no better feeling for a pastor or a communicator than to have people go, ooh, ah, that was a word. Like, you know what I mean? Those things are cool. But if I get the ooh, ahs, but I don't get the communication that God wants you to have, then I'm missing the whole point of all of this. You didn't show up today for me to feel good about myself. You showed up today so that God can give you something where you leave here. It will empower you and make you better. And so my goal today is to get you to leave this place and think of every interaction differently. When you go to your place of work and that person has been working them nerves, starts to work them. You have a spiritual decision to make. It's not a natural decision. Do you want to do it or do you want God to do it? Do you want, do you want to feel the, gra- the, 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 I don't know, gratification of, binge, of binging yourself? I feel like there are prisons filled with people that needed that gratification. Not just physical prisons, but mental prisons. You know you did it. You know you did that back to them. And it felt good for a second, but it's now eating on you. How are we going to live our lives? Are we going to be Christ-like? Jesus was like, yo, you want to be great? You got to become a slave of all. That's why I wore the work vibe today to be an illustration that serving in the kingdom is not about swag. It's not even about your career. It's not a career only. Like this, It's not a way to do it. You know that, even in your own life. There's a difference between your career and your calling. They're two different things. In fact, let me run these down really fast, and then I want to let you guys go. Your career is chosen by you, but your calling is chosen by God. You choose what you want to do for a living, right? Your career is your profession, but your calling is your mission. Your career is how you make money. Your calling, you may never get paid. Serving over salary, right? (laughs) And your career is how you make your living, but your calling is how you fulfill your life purpose. Thank God that I knew that this was a vehicle because I would have stopped there. I did well there financially. I could have stayed in career, but man, it just was like something was drawing me beyond it. It put pressure on me. Serving put pressure on me to be everything that God called me to be. And I want to pray for you guys that God will put pressure on you that you will be everything he called you to be. Some of it will be in the house of God. Most of it will not be here. Most of your serving will not be in this place. It'll be when the way you treat people where you go. It'll be how you treat the server, how you treat the person at the grocery store, how you treat the person at the gas station, how you throw your money down at people that talk to you different. They talk to you crazy and you want to get them back. Among you, it will be different. God is calling you to live a life of service and to give your life to serve his purpose. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Lord, help us understand that serving is a key to elevation. If we ever want to be great, we have to serve. You said the greatest in the kingdom is the one that serves. Teach us how to serve and see the beauty and the joy of serving. Lord, we love you. We want to be like you. And we know you did not come to be served but to serve and give your life as ransom for many. And there may be some people in this room that are like, Lord, I tried that before and they took advantage of me. 
Lord, I pray that they would realize that there is no such thing as a seed that goes in the ground that doesn't reap a harvest for them. So, Lord, let them realize that the time is coming of their harvest and they just need to be patient. Don't be anxious, but trust you and trust you again to use them even in this next season. And there are those, Lord, in this house that want to serve in your house. They have gifts and talents, but have been not ready to use them. Lord, touch their hearts, soften their hearts, give them courage to serve in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.